I want to thank everyone for coming to this very, very interesting session of Student Global Health Conversation Series. So my name, for those who don't know me, is Jesse Casanova. So I oversee all global programs for USF Health. So those are the Colleges of Nursing, Medicine, Pharmacy, and Public Health. Um, and this has been an initiative that we started at the height of the pandemic, or at the beginning of the pandemic, as a way to keep connected between our student bodies. We have a lot of collaborations with partners such as Universidad Ses Medellin. And um, we wanted to keep that conversation going. Even though we couldn't be there in person, we could at least have those conversations and keep the idea of global health uh, alive and, and continue to further the research that everyone is doing. And you'd be surprised the number of research projects that come out of some of these conversations here. So what I always tell students on both sides is come into these conversations with an open mind um, because you never know, you might find something of interest for research um, that you can use for yourself as well. And on top of that, you already have a connection with a global partner that is doing similar research. So um, without further ado, I'll let Dr. Lillard introduce herself. Um, and then from Dr. Lillard, we'll have Dean Bessi. So before we enter this, I want to introduce our partner university. So this is Universidad Ses in Medellin. We've had a very long standing partnership with them. And in fact, we just got back from doing a student medical mission trip of IHSC. So that was actually students from medicine, public health, and pharmacy that were doing a week long medical mission in one of the communities, a very disenfranchised community. So this is a, a, one of our strong partners and Dean Badesi is the Dean of the College of Nursing. Um, for the university. Um, and I know she'll introduce herself as well. Dr. Lillard. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Lillard. I'm a distinguished university health professor here at the University of South Florida College of Public Health. And I'm here today in that capacity, but also I'm director of the Activist Lab. Um, we started the Activist Lab in 2018, 2019. <laughs> There's a camera. So students could learn. Um, to be exemplary advocates and leaders in public health. And so I'm, we're, we're just thrilled to be here today to talk with you about this issue of homelessness that we have um, in the United States. And we're anxious to hear about it in your country here as well. So again, thank you for the invitation. Okay, okay. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Dex Berbesi. I am Dean in the Faculty on School Nursing in the CES University. I'm very happy for the <laughs> meeting and is a special for the topic and homeless. Thank you. And uh, Lucas. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Lucas Arias. I'm a physician. I uh, graduated from El CES which is the university where I perform my master in public health. And I have been working for the last 16 years with the city of Medellin, uh, leading the project of is, what is taking care of the homeless population here at the city. Thank you for having us today. Thank you. This is Ellie, I'm the student <laughs> and professor. Good afternoon. Um, I am Hiseli Matahira. I am a nurse and I have a master of public health too, like Lucas. And in this moment, I'm studying a um, public health PhD. And it's nice to stay here with us. And I hope that this, this meeting uh, would be a, a, a excellent uh, time for sharing our experiences and our comments of, of global health. Thank you. And I can have the students starting over here. Introduce yourselves. Hi, Marin. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Michaela. Do you want to say Yeah, say, say okay. what year you're in. Oh, uh, my second year and PhD student in epidemiology and global health. And I'm Michaela. I'm in my last semester of the MPH program uh, concentrating in global communicable disease. Hi, I'm Madison. I graduated with my MPH in December. I was concentrating in health policy and programs. Um, I now work under Dr. Liller with the Access Lab as the program planner analyst. 
Hey, I'm Fai. I'm a first year MBA student and my concentration is epidemiology and global communicable disease. Hello everyone, I'm Jenny. I'm a sophomore degree in health sciences Hey, baby. Can you Said I got it. You got it? Yeah, yeah I figured it out. Like when I was in the bathroom, because I had time to like. So if your students online, can you quickly unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves? From USF, I mean USF students online. USF? Yeah. yeah. Right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Ronaldo Trejos. I'm a doctoral student um, in, commun uh, in public health at the University of Florida. And I work under Dr. Liller um, in the activist lab as a graduate research assistant. And I also was um, lucky to be able to be a student project lead for um, an educational program on homelessness that was done in um, collaboration with Morsani College of Medicine and the Tampa Bay Street Medicine team, which provides direct access to services and navigation services um, to health and health related services for homeless populations um, and individuals at risk for homelessness in Tampa, Florida. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nicholas Cropper. I am uh, a member of the USF uh, College of Public Health uh, activist lab. Um, I am in my final semester of my master of public health program um, and I'm excited to hear more about your experience and try to get some perspective that might be useful for us and hopefully we can share something that might be useful for you as well. Okay, thank you everyone and so Dr. Lillard will uh, start her presentation. Can everyone see the PowerPoint slides? Can you see them? Or if you want me to. Uh... Okay. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. okay. Oh, well, very, very good. So um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about this homelessness situation. And as Rolando said, he um, did work on this project uh, with myself and also with Dr. Joe Bond here at the college and with other uh, students as well. Um, as we dealt with the seriousness of this issue, we saw, we've also had some uh, things we do called Find Your Voice seminars where we've had experts in this area come and talk as well. So we're excited to bring you the information. We're even more excited, I think, to hear your take on all of this as well. So first of all, the activist lab. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time um, with that. I wish we had more time, but let's see if this is going to work. Um, just wanted to, to tell you a little bit about who we are. This is our website. And um, as you can see, I'll just start here. This is a little bit who we are. Um, Madison introduced herself. We now have two graduate students that work with us, uh, Rolando, as well as Farshi, Faizi, who just started, and our administrative assistant, who couldn't be here today, but uh, she's not feeling well, but uh, KY. So that's pretty much the group, but importantly, our student advisory board, that's kind of an older picture, we have to get a new one up there, but we have about a 10 to 12 member uh, student advisory board that really is, I think, the heart of the activist lab because they are the ones that work with me directly along with Madison and, and Rolando and Parshid on the direction we're gonna take, the topics we're going to do, and um, how we're gonna explore these. And some of the ways we do this in the activist lab is we do it various ways. We have a podcast called Advocation Change It Up. And uh, I'd love for y'all to be uh, listen to our podcast. We tackle many important topics. We just did injustices among marginalized groups. We have one coming up on the Medicaid issue here in the United States, which is a real problem now after COVID. And um, many issues we do, uh, we've done structural racism, 
Um, we've also looked at issues related to everything from sexual assault to motor vehicle injuries to all kinds of things we've done. So hopefully you'll take a look. I'm the host, but I always have a student co-host as well with me. An exciting new project we have now is called Adopt a School. Adopt a School is where we're working with students in, in uh, middle school and in high school to really teach them about advocacy early so that they get the message about advocacy. There's no magic to advocacy on these different topics once you get to a university level. You can start very, very young. And so we're teaching them the ropes and they're working on some projects right now. We have Find Your Voice seminars and our last one, this happened to be on homelessness. Uh, Mr. Antonio Boyd did, Bird did a talk on homelessness in Tampa and things that we can do to advocate for change. And so you can take a look at those. We just did a public health in a minute. So if you only have a minute and you want to learn about a topic, hit that and public health in a minute takes you one minute about what somebody's passionate about and what they're advocating for. And we have professionals in various areas that have done that, including our Dean, uh, Dean Donna Peterson, who advocated for voting as the most, one of the most important ways to advocate. Our lunch and learns are really developed and hosted by students uh, on the board about different topics where we do literature review and we take a look at a topic and then people come in with Q&A sessions. Well, one of the largest things we do and the one that really um, keeps us up at night worrying about, at least me, is the Activist Lab Boot Camp. This is a one day full event where we immerse people in topics of advocacy. And not only that, people get the opportunity to prepare opinion or briefs about an issue and that is critiqued by advocates, attorneys, people who have been in the House and Senate. And so it's, it's quite a day. And now we've turned this into a course as well uh, for continuing education credits. Activist Lab on the road. Activist Lab is on the road where students said, we'll take, hey, we'll take this and we'll go on the road and we'll find issues and people they can talk with and how they're advocating. Michaela's here. She did our last one about a really important project that she was successful with her and her group um, to, there was some zoning issues uh, and they were successful in keeping some developers out of the very pristine area. And so uh, she was very successful at that. So that's just some examples of things that we do. We also do research. Uh, we've done a variety of research topics. We've worked with the University of Pittsburgh on some epidemiology topics. We've been funded by um, the APHA Action Grants. We've been funded by Research America to tackle these projects and often to prepare briefs or to prepare podcasts and things. So the students are afforded many opportunities as they work with the activist lab. Ellen Kent is here. She runs the USF Health uh, Shared Student Services. And basically what she does is wonderful because she allows the students to really partner with so many people across USF Health, which is nursing, medicine, physical therapy, pharmacy, many different areas. And so we get to work with them in the USF Health Service Board. Um, there's so many other things we do. We work with the Guardian at Lighter program, which is the voice for students. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the voice for children who are in the foster care system. And it's their voice in court. A guardian works with them and is not a parental guardian, but actually is a guardian that advocates for them in terms of whether they return to their family or they stay in foster care. There's the Moolah program, which is a program where I pair students with agencies so that they get immersed in that experience and many other things. And let's see, we've won a few awards every now and then. Um, we win, uh, we've won uh, the Civic Engagement Award, the Action Award, we've done a variety of things that we've done. And if you want to know what we're up to, if you look at our calendar, this <coughs> our calendar of events, you can see when we do seminars, when we do outreach, we have a board meeting every week on Thursday at five o'clock. And if you ever want to join us here in Tampa, it is done usually virtually. We have one meeting a month where we meet in person. But please join us, you know, please join us and uh, you can hear about all the stuff we're doing. So that is a little bit about the Activist Lab. We also have resources if you want to learn more about advocacy, you want to learn more about, we still have our COVID-19 resources up there, still important, still an important issue, violence and self-care resources. 
So that is the activist lab. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to share with you who we are and uh, what we do. All right. So let's talk about this homelessness issue, why we're really uh, here tonight. Just wanted to share with you that on any night, nearly 600,000 Americans are what we consider homeless or unhoused. Okay, now the issue with that is yes. So about 30% of people, so without homes, this is not a new situation. They have had chronic patterns of homelessness, which means they've been without a home for more than 12 months, or they have experienced extended periods of homelessness maybe not consecutively and consistently, but still enough over the past three years. Now, 60% of individuals who experience homelessness are male. However, we're seeing an increase in cases rising by 5% or more among women and girls. Where we have found a lot of progress in the United States, I think with homelessness has been among our military veterans. We've really tried to reach out. It's not perfect by any means. But I think we've done a lot of efforts there, but we have so much more to do with different population groups. Homelessness, let's take a look at Florida. We are the third largest state with the number of people experiencing homelessness. So Florida is a large state. In 2022, there were nearly 26,000 such individuals. So one of the things that hopefully Rolando and others will address is how do we view homelessness? You know, what do we do about it? Basically, we like to look at this more in what we call a socio-ecological lens, where we look at not only the person who finds themselves experiencing homelessness, but we look at also the relationships that they're in, or we call interpersonal. We also look at the community, which is very important as well as the organizational structure and policy or system issues. So what's really important here is that I view homelessness myself as largely a systems issue. I mean, I, I know that there are people uh, that have certain conditions or afflictions that may put them at risk of experiencing homelessness, but I believe that it's, I really do believe it's more of a system issue that we need to fix. So, and again, Rolando can address that. So we look forward, that's just a few slides. Jesse said I can only have three or four slides. So <laughs> I am complying with what he said. So um, I'm excited to hear what, what you'd like to share with us in your area so we can you know, talk about how to advocate for change. Okay, so the, uh, that's it. If you, if you have a presentation, you can share. Okay, I continue and um, the first Lucas. Okay. Okay, so next slide, please, Proxima. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Leader, for sharing us about the activist lab. Very interesting what you are doing in your state. Well, here we have the, in the in this slide in the top, we have the banner of uh, the address of the DANE, which is the National Statistics Department of Colombia that has uh, performed the census for the whole Colombian population. Uh, this population, the homeless population, has also been counted uh, for the very first time by the DA, the National Statistics uh, Department. Uh, based on the, of the census, the population of the city, which are, we are located, uh, is about 2.5 million by 2020. And the population in Colombia is about 50 or 51 million by 2020. Here is the map where we are located and here is the, there is a picture of our city. Um, Next, please. Next slide. Slide. Uh, looking forward, of the slide you just present about the homeless conditions on situation in the state, uh, we don't know, we not only uh, talk about people that has not home. We are talking about people that is living in the street for long period. Uh, in the slide, in the uh, sign that is on the top right on the top, left on the top, we have counts 
by that time, 2020, about 3.7 thousand uh, uh, people living in the streets, especially uh, men. 85% men were, were men and 14% were women. Uh, this is a very uh, common character characteristic in Colombia. Uh, most of the people that live in the street are men, especially because women has a, another kind of social uh, role uh, and that covers or protects the women uh, more than men to live in the street. Uh, on the bottom, on the left, we have the time living in the streets. The highest is five years or, or more, which has 73%. That means that we have chronic people living in the streets. And no, 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 the last, the, the prior, please, please, yes. And we see the main reason for living on the streets. Drugs is one of the common uh, issues that the people uh, establish that has the cause. Mm, due to they uh, went to dwell the streets, drugs by 30% and domestic violence by 28%. Some of the people that established that domestic violence was of one, one of the main cause uh, is those that uh, start living in the street at a very young age because they left their homes due to the domestic violence. Uh, there's also a special mm, uh, condition that we established like lifestyles is because they like to live in the street because they have no rules. They have not not to pay rent or to have any uh, things to uh, respond for. So the other one is poverty, uh, five point four percent. Most of the people think that people in the street live in because of the poverty, but that's not the only reason here in our city or in our country, especially. Uh, we also have another uh, item, which is displacement. We have uh, in Colombia some uh, unsecure conditions, in, especially in uh, abroad areas, jungle areas or uh, non-city areas, which uh, makes the people to move to the main cities and establish themselves in the streets uh, to survive. So displacement, uh, has the 5.1% of the main cause or reasons to, for living in the streets. Next slide, please. Well, here we have also what the way they're getting income, the way what they do for a living. Recycling is one of the most uh, activities that they perform on the streets, 40%. Cleaning cars, setting up the lights, uh, 24%. Others, I don't know if others, uh, are related to robbery or to illegal conditions, but it's not. It's very difficult to establish because of the way we ask for the source uh, to the people. Also, begging for money, twelve percent, and if we see the literacy rate, you can tell that fourteen percent are high literacy and eighty-five percent can read. We also have some other statistics about if they are going to school, finishing high high school or university, but it's not shown here. We, you can go to the banner. I showed you to the, the address and you can find out some more information. Uh, disabilities. It's very important for us to understand that mm, disabilities is 30% of the population established that they have uh, the condition of any kind of disability, physical or mental disabilities. Uh, so without difficulties, 81, 86%. That means that is this is not one of the main causes, but it's an important one. So we have uh, 30 per, uh, 13% of the population living in the streets uh, suffering some kind of disability. Next slide, please. Next, yes. Yes, based on the main cause, which is the drug drugs that they established, that is the main cause of living in the streets, we have two uh, uh, things here. The one of the is in the top is the main substance that they are using right now, and we can tell fifty-two percent abusers or or use bazooka, which is a crack cocaine. It's a very common drug okay. in the streets, and followed by cigar or tobacco and then marijuana. Uh, most of the population in the streets used to mix and to be poly users. 
So the figure that is on the bottom uh, shows us the actual or the current use of any drug. And currently, they're using at the same time cigar, bazooka, which is crack cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, cocaine. So they mix all these drugs as far as they are, they are available and also they can afford it. But especially bazooka or crack cocaine is one of the most used drugs on the streets for our people here in Medellin. Next slide, please. Here we have a non-chronic uh, transmittable disease, uh, also tuberculosis and HIV, which is very important for us in public health. Um, we, we have 89% of the people established that they have uh, a condition, but has no diagnosis. I mean, they established that they have uh, some kind of, uh, this kind of disease, but has no follow-up or any contact with the health system. Uh, those who establish this condition uh, says that it has a hypertension, 63%, diabetes, 38%, uh, cancer, 6.7%. Uh, but here we have uh, two most, two very important for us, especially in public health, which is tuberculosis, 14%, and HIV, AIDS, uh, which is 11%. Actually, uh, it says has, uh, we have performed some uh, research on both uh, tuberculosis and HIV uh, population uh, research to see what's going on with them, how they can get access to diagnose and also to medications and some kind of help in the health system. Next, please. And here we have the well-being and social services, the public ones. We also have uh, some NGOs that has uh, infrastructure to help this population, but here is what the city is currently doing. Uh, first, we have uh, the outreach team, which is linked with uh, one to three. One to three is the same thing that, like uh, 911 in your country. So uh, any person can call to 911 and to uh, demand or to establish that there's, there is a person suffering on the streets uh, having seizure, having uh, some poisoning or intoxication, or uh, if they need any special needs. So we can send the street bus with some psychosocial team and go there and pick them up to take them uh, to any social shelter, or if they need any health uh, evaluation or assessment, we can take them also to the health system. Uh, once we have the first uh, in concert with the population, we perform a uh, uh, research, uh, an, an interview, sorry, to get access to the social services and also to the health insurance coverage. Um, so, that, so that's why the second step is the basic needs shelter. And uh, we have actually two. One of the, the number one is uh, only do, during the daytime. So they can have food, self-care, they can also have psychosocial and medical services. And the second one is open 24 hours and they can get access to, especially to dorms and all of the other services that I just told. Uh, we have a special chair there for special needs. If they have a surgery, if they have a trauma, because they used to have a, a lot of uh, car accidents as uh, pedestrians, also tuberculosis and cancer or AIDS, we have also uh, shelters to take care of them while while they uh, get better or while the, the condition uh, goes on. So this area, we call it caring. So we take care of the pe people on the basic needs on also, and also on their shelter for their recovery. The fifth uh, number is for shelter for disabilities, but for chronic ones. Sorry, if they have a mental or physical disability, they can access to some shelter to get uh, for forever. I mean, I mean for life uh, if they really need it. Sorry, <laughs> excuse me. And the the uh, last one is the social rehabilitation. Uh, it's not a recovery for only for drugs. We also uh, have a rehabilitation in 
in their lives uh, based on uh, risk and damage reduction. We are not going for the zero consumption models. So we uh, explain them how to live, even if they are, if want to use drugs, but to use it in a, in a very safe way and to uh, recover part of their lives, getting a job or finalizing their studies or linking back again with their families. All the ties that they, they have lost, we try to reach them out and to uh, link on some of those ties in order to uh, build up a new life. So we also have a group or graduate uh, people from this social rehabilitation. We follow up all this uh, community in order to keep them then uh, avoiding to go back to streets. And this is uh, the um, a part of the process that we call overcome. I mean, to overcome the street condition. Uh, on the bottom, we have uh, the funeral. I mean, we also cover all the disease. The, if they die and they pass away, we can also cover the situation. And also we have the link with the health system uh, issuing the public insurance that granted to them access to the public health system. If you see, we uh, are not talking here about migrants. Mi mi migrants here are not considered uh, homeless because we have a policy that grant them when they show up here to our country and a special condition that we grant them like social security number and also access for uh, having a job and also health coverage. So we have uh, an, a special project that serves um, people that is uh, in condition that migrates from other countries. So that's why we don't uh, consider them as a homeless as far as they are not really living and having a homeless lifestyle. So they have another kind of uh, project that uh, help them. So this is especially uh, mainly the, the whole system that serves the homeless population in the city. It goes uh, up and down, depends of the government that is uh, handling and leading the city. And is based on the budget that the city council established every fiscal year for them. But basically it's the same thing, the same uh, uh, kind of shelters and help that they used to get and the public uh, city provides for them. Uh, now we have uh, some research that we have performed based on what I told, uh, and Depsy is going to continue with the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, I'm going to talk about three studies that made by research group. The first activity um, active syphilis in in homeless in associated factors. Uh, the objective is uh, the, to identify the personal and social demographic factors associated with the syphilis infection in homeless in Medellin, especially in Medellin, and uh, study, a cross-sectional study on the 145 homeless. In, in between uh, eight, 18 and in 59 years old. And the result and the principal uh, domain, the syphilis infection in homeless people uh, was the 27 uh, person and the people with greater grace at Kiri syphilis infection where uh, women is the principal the factor and single people and the uh, uh, the Lucas tell um, uh, the bazooka consumer is the uh, the uh, principal the uh, drug illicit for the homeless and the we previous diagnostics of syphilis and the conclusion I I higher that expected presence of syphilis in homeless in Medellin. Uh, the factor associate repeat the women single people bazooka consumer. And the uh, people with previous diagnosis on syphilis are the most uh, predisposed individual at Kiri the infection. The second, the other uh, study, the factor associate the uh, perception, the health status on group the homeless um, in the same in Medellin, uh, other cross-sectional study 
um, the analyze the, the difference um, uh, associated the statistic. Uh, the rest of uh, 300 uh, street uh, the homeless. Uh, the principal result, uh, uh, 80, 82 uh, were males, and the same uh, the other uh, population, the homeless, the principal males. And uh, the conclusion was held uh, was associated with the begin having has the alcohol accidents or violence uh, and physical pain or specific discomfort. Uh, what is the relation with the uh, health system was common to both. In the first, the other uh, study, uh, HIV vulnerability, is the concept, uh, the principal the, uh, with the homeless the people. Uh, the, the principal result uh, for factors, uh, the, the first, uh, la, Factors uh, socio-demographic variables including age, gender, civil status, and education level. And conclusion on the HIV vulnerability is the, uh, defined uh, as the reduced ability to anticipate, uh, anticipate the novel and erroneous belief and resist the sexual practice and drug usage is the community, the sexual practice and drug usage is the, the main problem with the homeless and recover and social support and rejection is the uh, low the uh, social support for the homeless in Colombia and the Medellin and with limited the ability to accept and HIV prevention, attention, and support services. The, the, uh, the main uh, result for the homeless in Medellin and three studies. I other studies, uh, the, the research group, but is the principal for the uh, activity today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. That was really great information. Um, Rolando, do you want to share some information from your study as well now with everyone? Yeah, of course. Um, so what we did in our study was mm, we first started working um, around 2021. Um, Dr. Joel Bond and Dr. Liller and Dr. Um, Lynette Manassas, professors from both the College of um, Public Health and the um, Morsani College of Medicine, um, wanted to um, work in focus on what could be done to educate health professionals uh, around the needs and the complex needs and realities of homeless individuals and populations in Tampa. And the first thing that we did was we came back to the literature and developed a curriculum and educational um, program for um, students and faculty and staff in USF Health. Um, and he was um, given in um, as a, um, a lecture and also um, Q&A sessions um, that were open to the public and free of cost, trying to discuss and um, leverage some of that information for them to be able to integrate them into clinical practice and to um, into their work. And then after that, we saw that there was a dearth of information regarding homelessness, regard, um, especially when it comes to um, homelessness issues in urban cities. So therefore we conducted a scoping review um, of 49 um, articles that were um, then completely screened and synthesized. And the main um, findings from that scoping review was uh, the, multiple layers of complexity of the needs of this population. And that refers back to what Dr. Lilla was saying when she was speaking about um, the social ecological model. That was exactly the model that we used to um, describe the results of the scoping review. And on top of that, we were lucky enough to have the Morsani um, um, College of Medicine with us because they also provided um, a full overview of the homelessness situation in Tampa Bay um, it, during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and how um, community-based partnerships um, with religious organizations um, like were presented by 
um, Dr. Arias in Medellin that have played a crucial role in leveraging those kind of services sometimes that may be limited from a public sector. Um, they, we were able to connect to them and then um, be able to have them join us in our um, project and um, join us in our initiative. And at the end, that resulted in presenting our results to the Florida Department of Health, which resulted in the creation for a homelessness caucus for the um, uh, for Hillsborough County, which is the province uh, in the state of um, Florida that we are at. And um, it was just a, um, a tremendous um, collective effort in which everybody got the opportunity to learn a lot from each other and like, just um, support each other for helping um, this community. And Rolando, if you can put maybe in the chat the link to the article so that people could read that, um, there's really some interesting information as we focus, as you said, on the social ecological model there. And um, also your information, uh, Dr. Arias, about um, different uh, facets that help the homeless. We had, um, if you listen to our um, a presentation by um, Antonio Bird, he goes into that in a lot of detail also, as well as what we do in the Tampa Bay area, the different organizations that help. And his message was the 0.1%, which basically if people gave 0.1%, just 0.1% of what they earn, we could really tackle this homeless problem definitely in our immediate area. So we'd be glad to share that information. Um, I did have a, a request from a question. Um, could you all address um, uh, the effect of the Venezuelan refugees on the homeless issue um, in your country? And that's for Dr. Dr. Arias or for as a dean. Well, it's a main issue in our country, um, the migrants, of course. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have a, a 2 million or almost 3 million Venezuelans coming from uh, his their country in the last five years. But we have a special uh, uh, visa for them mm -hmm. that has uh, granted them some uh, access to job and to health access and also for uh, housing and everything and special programs so uh we also have uh not only venezuelans but also people coming from brazil argentina and even africa that are trying to cross the border and to go up all over central america to get into the united states but it's stuck here because they uh, have no money or because they also get involved in drugs uh, problems. So as far as they are living in the, on the streets and they have no uh, network like family or someone that has support and can support them, we uh, consider them as a homeless and we provide them the whole benefits I just show you as the shelter and all the rehab programs. But based on, uh, on the um, office of uh human rights that we have in our cities we cannot treat them as a uh, homeless uh indeed i mean that as that is the last condition that we can uh we can treat them so if we are going to provide them some help we need to really uh, establish that they have passed by the whole process of getting the uh, Colombian ID, the special ID that they are, they has been, they have been granted, and they have uh, the access for all the benefits like housing, health, and job access that the government has. So if we have all these uh, steps um, passed by, and we can demonstrate that they have uh, no family or they have no skills to afford a house or to get a job, or they are they have a uh, conditions, mental conditions, or any other kind of disability or difficulties to get along with others and to get a job or to, I mean, to assume their lives so we can take them and we have uh, the same benefits. But it's not, uh, let's say, 
uh, it's about 5% of the population of the whole homeless population that we have in our city that has another nationality and not only Venezuelans. Because as I challenge you, we have also people from coming from Argentina, Ecuador, Peru, uh, and also Africa. So it's not in a, in a condition that makes them to become homeless. Uh, probably they don't have a real home. I mean, they don't own their own home, but uh, the government provides them uh, homes uh, in a special ways um, for rent or with some kind of like Project Ocho, uh, Project 8 in that you have in, in Florida, uh, probably in that way, but it's not considered like a real homeless as, as far as they are not living in the streets. And there's another thing, we don't have a like families dwelling in the streets. We have uh, people, single people, or little uh, uh, groups or people, because we have another uh, law that does not uh, allows us to have children on the street. So all the children has to be protected by the government and they take the children to the shelters to reestablish their rights. Um, to get into a process to recover uh, or the families or to get uh, into the school process. And so we don't have, potentially we don't have our children dwelling on the street because they are uh, a, under the social services a, a procedures. So that's why we don't consider them on based on the census as a homeless because we do have a public programs and not only programs of the cities are a national uh, program. So it's for the whole uh, country, not only, actually the, the, the budget it's granted by the uh, Colombian government, not for the state or city government. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question. No, no, that's great. That's great. Okay, very good. So, well, we can talk probably a long time about all these things, but I'm going to turn it over to the students now to see if they've got questions. And um, because we work on many issues and, and homelessness is one of them with advocacy, we, we'd love to spend a few minutes talking with you about, you've talked about your services and they're very similar um, in the United States, but um, how, like what I have understood about homelessness in your country is that it, it, it's basically a serious problem as it is in America, as it is in the United States. So what, what are people doing to advocate for change? Or what, what are people doing? Do you have any advocacy groups or people that work on this issue or students? Are there any student groups that work on this issue? And we're gonna, and then I'm gonna let the students ask a question. Any, does anybody have a question before? <laughs> Questions, anyone? I mean, that was a good question. Okay. They already they answered a question by the question. by the chat uh -huh. based on the tuberculosis on uh, lepra. Yeah, so I already answered about it. If someone wants to read it, okay. Okay. Yeah, we well while we're working on that, Michaela. Yeah, you got a question. It was not a question; it's an answer to oh, it's like stuff that we do here. Yeah. Um. So I don't have any like specific like coalitions or like groups in mind, but I know across the U.S., especially over the past several years, has been a a big initiative among communities um to basically help either provide a uh, um, materialistically, um, if there was any needs that they needed, or going to specific uh, uh, meetings, uh, governmental meetings or commissioner meetings regarding uh, their homelessness population. So, uh, just an example that's like off the top of my head. Uh, if you're looking at like Los Angeles and California, they have a massive, massive homelessness population, but just like other areas here in the US and in LA, um, a lot of the times these individuals get dehumanized and they're no longer seen as people who are part of the, the larger community. 
And so they, add, so cities start adding in a lot of um, uh, certain aspects to the built environment that basically prevents um, uh, individuals experiencing homelessness from being able to have a place to sleep under a highway or have a bench to sit at at mm -hmm. night. Um, they'll start adding in spikes to certain places so they can't lay down. Um, they In LA, there was a massive tent city where um, just groups of them live together in tents, basically, and a lot of places in the US, but specifically LA, um, are these massive callings by local officials to basically have um, cops go in and basically tear down their dwellings where these, these people call, uh, where they have basically their whole life at. And I know that there's a lot of communities on social media and locally um, that are helping to fight against these things from happening or having certain policy or initiatives that um, add to uh, the prevention from them being able to have a place to sleep within the city by adding yeah. in the spikes and stuff into their the built environment. So I don't, I don't have anything like the, a name on top of my head, but I do know as a community, as a whole here, at least in the US, I'm starting to see people speak up either using social media as an outlet mm -hmm. to do so or, um, going out there and like being able to talk to them and have a conversation with them yeah. and basically help fight against those things from happening. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's good. Um, we also had in, in the paper that um, I worked on with Rolando, which had Tampa Bay street medicine, you know, that was out there helping people right there on the street. And we have so many other services here, you know, um, the ministry, so many, so many homeless groups. And again, if you go to um, Antonio's presentation, you'll hear all about that. But certainly in the United States, um, it's, it's a really serious problem. As Michaela was saying, um, there are people that, um, you know, these kind of services, as she was saying, they, they don't want them. I mean, they, they, to put it bluntly, they just don't want this in their community. They don't want home, people experiencing homelessness around. Um, I'm careful with my language as I was corrected by Mr. Bird because he doesn't say homeless people. It's because that labels people. So it's basically people experiencing homelessness, which I think is a, is a better term there. Um, they don't want to be home. I mean, I don't know anybody that wants this, um, but certainly, um, you know, I think the numbers are increasing and um, not quite sure, you know, all the health and services. That's why I brought it to a systems issue. Because I think this is important, you know, as he was saying, the 0.1% of income money. I mean, money is going to help a lot of this. I mean, with services, with programs, with things like that, that, that we can do in the United States. So we're just curious. Some of the things you all are doing, you know, um, I thought were pretty good, you know, that you're protecting a lot of the members of the uh, people experiencing homelessness, the children, and things such as that. Whereas I can tell you that you know, um, I wish we did that better in the United States um, in terms of protecting children and other real vulnerable groups that, that do experience homelessness. So, so what we're trying to do is, is really try to work on these issues here, you know, continue on with the research, maybe do some projects. And, and we'd love to, you know, maybe, uh, does anybody else have any, any questions or things? We'd love to really partner with you all in, in these efforts. I know um, Rolando, do you want to speak to anything about that with the group? Yes. Oh, yes. Before we get to Rolando, just a minute. Erin? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually currently working on a paper about like homelessness with a, um, a group. And we did a whole like community assessment of the resources right. in Tampa. Um, and they Tampa has currently has like a continuum of, of care. Right. So there's a lot of different organizations that all just work together on the homelessness issue. Um, and that type of care has a very like it's like traditional model of like you know helping people that are experiencing homelessness yeah so what we're doing is looking at other models and one that is Brit has shown a lot of success um especially in Canada and some places in Europe is the housing first model mm -hmm. where you put like people into housing first and then you kind of like once they are stable there then you start addressing those other things 
So I guess my question was like, Mm -hmm. is that something that you heard of, something that you're trying to implement? Like, um, looking or any other types of models that you're looking at? Yeah. Which goes back to the system issue. You know, we were talking about housing, she's saying is, is in, you know, different uh, countries on housing first, because we believe, we believe that, at least I, I think from the research, <laughs> and, and I think a, a lot of folks believe that, and again, I'm going to bring Rolando back in, but basically, this is, I think that's so important, you know, we know that housing and education are two of those social determinants of health that really are quite protective you know, for individuals. And so, so that's one thing is we look at why isn't there enough housing and why, 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 you know, I often ask, you know, in the United States, why, why do we, why do we continue to have, continue to have this issue? And I think a lot of it is a, it, it is a problem when you give people waivers, as we learned in some different lectures, where you think, oh, this is enough money for them to get into housing. Well, they give them a little bit of money, but the housing costs now in Florida um, and in the United States are, are, are just out of this world. I mean, to, to afford anything. So even though they may get a waiver, a small amount of money from the government in the United States, it's not going to be enough for them to get into housing, far less sustain housing. So, you know, so we've got that issue. So when, you know, people, organizations say, yes, we provide this or we provide that, well, really, you know, but can they use it? You know, I mean, is it usable for people experiencing homelessness? So, so I think it's a, it's a huge issue. And as I said, it, you got to look at all the levels. You have to look at individual problems, as you all, you know, really well said about the different conditions that people experience homelessness have. And, and, and as you learn about them, but I think we also have to look larger. I think we have to go up from that, you know, to get to the, to the more systems issues. So anyway, Rolando, do you want to uh, say anything about that? No, yeah, um, 100%. I, I think that Erin's question is um, fantastic and, and your comments are definitely on point, Dr. Lillard. Yeah, really no, my, with what we were yes, my, my question was going to be more regarding so um, in the United States, we have a very individualistic perspective of health. And one of the most difficult things is to scale into communities interventions. However, a lot of the interventions that were described by Dr. Arias and by Dr. Brapassi were actually interventions within the community. So thinking about homelessness um, from a community perspective and from a populational perspective, do you consider it is easier to escalate and to um, have effective interventions within communities in a country like Colombia versus a country like the United States, for example. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that there is the same problem, but we have different uh, issues, issues or causes. Uh, for example, Housing First is one of the most globally most known uh, strategy for con, for homeless uh, e, yeah phenomenon, but in our country we have a lot of people that has no house. I mean, uh, a lot of families that cannot afford a house. Uh, not also because they don't have the money, also because they don't have the opportunity to study, to get a better job, or even to get a job. So it's not about only giving the house. Yeah. Uh, for example, we have uh, an ex- we have uh, an experience. With homeless, we, we grant them some houses, and they don't really know how to pay the rent, to pay the, to right. pay the utilities, and mm-hmm. to take care of the responsibilities. But it's not only about house, it's housing, it's about also how to uh, teach them how to behave, how to get responsible for their own lives. Uh, if you go uh, for the communities, uh, um, rehabilitation based on communities, that's a good, uh, a strategy, I, I think, for everybody, as far as they, the community understand that there is not only what cause. If you uh, have a drug problem, you can go to rehab and then do something else. But it's not only about drugs. It's also about uh, better education, opportunities right. for having a better job, or to uh, overcome some kind of uh, traumas or mental or physical disabilities. So it's, it's not uh, that that easy about only having one, giving like one target to one spot. Yeah, you need to uh, consider the phenomena as a whole 
and you can cover some special needs or basic needs while you are trying to overcome the condition. But you uh, count on the community and the community understand that uh, there are some people that is suffering dwelling on the streets and has some kind of uh, special conditions. You can uh, convoke more and make a better job as far as they are uh, mm, sensibilized on, on the problem. But uh, this is also about money and it's very expensive yeah. to uh, afford all the well-being that they need. Actually, if you have a, a person that is uh, not taking care of the, their health, their, their chronic condition will rise and rise and rise and they are going to get into ER not only for uh, hypertension, they are only have that now they will have a yeah. stroke and a lot of uh, uh, bad things due to their main condition that has not been under control. So it's a public health issue, but also a social and community issue. So we can, I think we can work, we need to work in several areas and most of the areas are uh, social, psychological, psychosocial and community community areas also. Right. I don't know. Right, exactly. That's and my, that, my that, opinion. That's right. Yeah. And that's why it's a system, you know, that's why we were saying it's a system issue, you know, right? It's more than just, as you said, the housing. Um, I think we had um, your student there had a, had a question or a comment. Jason? Hi. Hi. On the other hand, I think that it's important to think about the, the kind of relationship of people. In our country, for example, the 47% of all people homeless came to this situation due to the family abandonment or precarious family relationship. And yeah. our countries have different contexts, but I think that uh, maybe uh, a cause a cause that have a similar maybe as the kind of relationship. I think that is very important to mm -hmm. think, to study these these mechanisms that maybe uh, will came to all. I'm talking about all people. <laughs> all people um, became homeless. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, it it is, it, and that's part of the social ecological model relationship. You know, that's part of that model. So I agree. That's a that's a that's an important area to look at to look at as well. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So we want to who's next? Okay. So I want to uh, just do a final thank you to everyone uh, for participating. So this has been a very very interesting conversation to be able to understand the complexities of homelessness. And some of the root causes of those can be quite different in each country. But if we look at it from a system's whole, we see a lot of similarities and we see a lot of similar lines of potential research as well. Um, thank you, Dr. Arias. Thank you, Dean Perbesi. I know that your time is, is very important and we appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Lillard, thank for you. facilitating yeah. on, our half, on our behalf. I feel um, like we just got started. I know. Oh. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out. We're, I'm happy to make that connection. And if this kind of stirs any ideas or any thoughts about doing research together, um, I, I would welcome that as well. Yeah, and, and, and before we conclude, I would just say that um, we would love to, um, the, the kind of studies that we've done here, we would love to maybe do yeah, with you. With you. Oh, and um, and, <laughs> and um, I just wanted to say too, if you want to know more about the activist lab, please reach out to us and join us. You know, we uh, every Thursday at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, we have our board meeting. So if um, your students are interested in joining us, so that we can talk further about this, or if you. Dean, you would like to come, Dr. Aries, we'd love to have you and uh, present your information to the whole lab. That would be great. 
and the invitation is always open. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>